we are going to shift over to our next speaker, uh, Dan. I think Dan has a little bit more than three minutes. Uh, you can you can fact check me on that one. But Dan tonight, uh, he's he's joined uh, staff with us this year with Pittsburgh Metro Crew after spending a few years in the Middle East uh, serving for crew over there. And a uh, fun fact about Dan is that he met his wife, Alicia, when they were in crew together at Ohio State University. Um, and I think we have a picture to show of when they uh, first started dating. There they are, Dan and Alicia, so cute. Uh, Dan, that hair, man, where, where, what happens? I love it. But anyways, uh, we're going to welcome up Dan. Thanks, guys. Well, blast from the past. That picture sends me back, man. I wish I had more of that hair. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Well, tonight we're going to talk about the, my topic is marriage. We've been kind of doing a um, relationships series. Uh, last week, Kristen talked about uh, singleness. This week, I'll be on marriage. And then uh, Luke Zappa is going to finish up the series next week about friendships. So, okay. When we talk about marriage, I find that people's opinions can be all over the place. Um, some people have a very low view of marriage. They might think it's like antiquated or honestly, they think it's just too risky. Um, did you know that the average marriage in the U.S. lasts only eight years? That's the average. <clears throat> and with divorce rates in America holding at 50 percent, it is in some ways an absolute risk. It's a 50-50 shot. Um, and so half the kids in America are growing up seeing marriage not work. And it only makes sense that they have no faith in it. <clears throat> I was thinking about playing a clip from a Netflix movie called A Marriage Story. You might have seen it if you watched all of Netflix during the pandemic. <clears throat> but I think they should have called it a divorce story because it, I'm pretty sure it didn't end well. I didn't watch the whole thing, just the clip. But in this clip, like Adam Driver um, from Star Wars and Scarlett Johansson have an incredibly intense fight that I, as I'm watching, I'm convinced it's going to turn into domestic abuse. Fortunately, it doesn't, but it ends up with Adam Driver screaming that he hates her and he wishes she was dead. And the saddest part is I was reading some of the comment section in the clip and uh, multiple people joked that they would often play this clip in the background when they were at home just to reminisce about their childhood. And so if that's their view of what marriage is, that is, that is so sad. On the other side of the spectrum, and a common view maybe within the church is kind of elevating marriage as the great thing you need to do in your life. And it's the expected thing um, if you want to be normal. And as Kristen talked about singleness last week, it's, it's kind of unhealthy to have those expectations for everyone. We simply don't know the story God has for us. And another unhealthy element in kind of elevating marriage is the thinking that getting a spouse is going to solve all your problems or is going to kind of like fulfill your life in every way. It might be cute or romantic to hear someone say that they were, they were lost until they found their spouse or that you complete me. Um, but I think, it, you know, that too, it just puts too much reliance on another person to be your source of joy and happiness. So even though marriage is like a high risk thing, most people still want to do it. Um, and it's because it has a chance for a high reward. Like God made us as relational beings and the intimacy and unity found in marriage can be extremely rewarding. And if you do get married, who you marry is one of the most important decisions you'll ever make. So tonight I want to look through one passage in Ephesians 5, it'll be verses 21 through 33. And um, let me make sure you guys are here. I, I lost your. Okay, yeah, we're good. And uh, so I'm going to go through Ephesians 5, and I want to cast vision for what a Christian marriage could look like and the beauty it can reflect about God to a lost world. And at the end, I want to give you just uh, two pieces of advice on selecting the right spouse. So before we jump in, let me just pray for us. Um, dear Jesus, I just pray that you open the word um, up to us, that as, as we read your scripture, um, you, would, you would speak to us, Lord, and would you use these words just to reflect the things that are true about you and what you designed for us in marriage. And uh, yeah, may we, may we um, tonight fall more in love with who you are. And then we pray, Jesus. Amen. 
Okay, so let's jump in and read. Um, <clears throat> so Paul is the author of Ephesians. It's six chapters. If, if you read the whole thing, it would take about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the first three chapters is on doctrine. And, or I'm sorry, yeah, the first three chapters of doctrine or theology. The last three chapters are on conduct or how to live out that doctrine. And so I'm going to jump in and read. So please uh, follow along. In 21, it says, and further, <clears throat> submit to one another they're out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means, uh, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. And this is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife and as he loves, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Okay, so I wanna start down in verse 31, where it says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. So Paul here quotes from the book of Genesis, the very first book in the Old Testament, and it's right after he creates Adam and Eve and kind of brings them together. And I want to spend a little bit of time on the concept of kind of two becoming one. So two, be two people becoming one might seem like some crazy math, yet it speaks to several amazing truths, I think, designed by God. And I want to share just three of them with you. The first one is that marriage helps us understand an aspect of God's character in terms of the Trinity. So we know the Trinity is as three in one, Father, God, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And uh, so how does the Trinity, so how does marriage reflect the Trinity? So, okay, are you with me on this? Two people get married and they consummate the marriage. Um, consummate's just a big word for sex. And in that process, the two people literally become one flesh. Two distinct persons united into one. God is three distinct persons, yet united in one being. And so this very design of marriage kind of helps us understand more of how amazing God is. Um, all analogies, I think, do break down, but I think it does give a little reflection to like just the, the multifaceted aspects of who God is. The second part is not only does God, um, not only does marriage reflect God's kind of like tension of distinct persons in complete unity, but on top of that, we are made in his image. And a part of that image bearing is the ability to create life. So for God, like in love, God spoke and he created the world and everything in it. And kind of God designed the context of marriage to be a place where love creates life, or at least that's, you know, God's design for it. And I think we take it for granted, but I think it's amazing when we sit and think about it, that God takes a little bit of the man and a little bit of the woman and he makes a child. Um, some people say that my kids look so much like me Others say our kids look so much like my wife, Alicia. Who's right? They're both kind of right, right? That's the amazing part that, that, that our union and expression of our love has created life, new, unique life in itself. Um, so that's number two. The third truth I want to share is uh, Paul says in verse 32, um, Paul says that like, the two becoming one is a great mystery, but illustrative of Christ in the church. And we kind of see him talk about this more in verse 25 it says just as christ loved the church he gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean and and 23 it says christ is the head of the church he is the savior of his body the church we often think of jesus um, and what he did for us in kind of very personal terms but here paul takes um he talks about the corporate relationship of the church in jesus in a way that we are kind of united to jesus much more like a marriage and this theme is carried out in the book of Revelation. So we've kind of gone from 
Genesis to Revelation already. But uh, the last book in the Bible, Revelation, it's about kind of the events that will happen at the end of human history and when God gathers all the Christian believers together. And he's calling this a marriage supper. So uh, read with me. We'll read Revelation 19, 6 through 9. It says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to, to me, these are the true words of God. So kind of given these three points, I feel like these verses really show that marriage is God's design. And it's meant to kind of reflect aspects of his character, like the, the Trinity, like creation, and, and, you know, for us reflecting that and having children. It reflects the relationship with Christ in the church. Kind of like putting all these things together, marriage is not just a convenient partnership we have, but it's a holy endeavor that reflects um, the nature of God. And as I've been kind of even thinking about this, I've noticed how different I've been approaching my wife this week. I'm remembering my marriage reflects these divine ideas. Um, Next, I want to talk about what it looks like to kind of practically put two people, unite them as one. Uh, C.S. Lewis it kind of explores this idea of what he calls one flesh. And I'll put up a, a quote from him. He says, this is in mere Christianity. And the Christians believe that when he said, God, this one flesh, um, this, he was not expressing a sentiment, but stating a fact. Just as one is stating a fact when one says that a lock and its key are one mechanism or that a violin and a bow are one musical instrument. The inventor of the human machine was telling us that, it, that its two halves, male and female, were made to be combined together in pairs, not simply on the sexual level, but totally combined. So we're gonna go back to the very first verse in, in our Ephesians passage and explore what it looks like as kind of like C.S. Lewis says, like being totally combined and, and what, how that practically works itself out. And in verse 21, it says, and further submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So to bring two people into oneness, I think there's a tension of maintaining being um, a distinct whole person. Yet at the same time, there has to be some level of them giving up their rights for the sake of the other person. And by giving up, up their rights, they make room for the other person within that marriage. And it can often look like treating the other person as more important than themselves. I mean, this can start off with simple things like what music to listen to in the car. Um, I was thinking last night, uh, I got in bed first. I was so comfortable, but I remember the dog needed taking out and I didn't want to do it. But I've, as I told you, I've been kind of thinking about these things and putting in light of, of what my marriage was. And so I went ahead and did it and I kind of caught my selfishness. Um, but then I think it can go easily from there up to difficulty with like questions of how many kids should we have and will we move to a new city for a job opportunity. And it's important that both parties are on the same page in terms of giving up the rights. Um, we're going to look at Paul's um, couple passages again in Ephesians and he kind of makes us very clear what these instructions are for kind of giving up our rights. Um, if you look at verse 22 again, it says, for wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And every, you know, later it says, in everything, submit to them. For husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. And then in 28, it says, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own bodies. No one hates his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. All right. Wives submitting in everything, husbands living sacrificially, laying down their lives. Um, I know that many people in our culture would balk at these points. And they would ask, like, why do I have to sacrifice so much for the sake of my spouse? And I think they would be right in asking that because it's not like any of us deserve that kind of unconditional love from others. And so this is what I think it comes down to. As Christians, we know we don't deserve God's unconditional love. We simply don't. Like we failed in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds. And yet, 
we freely have it. God showed us the depth of his love when Jesus sacrificed himself for the sake of us, for the sake of his church. And we can never earn it, but yet God, he, he still loves us. And if we can put our minds around that and we can accept God's love and accept God's grace, then, and I think only then, are we able to pour out that same unconditional love to others. And what better place to replicate God's love than in marriage? I think some of the most impactful moments in my marriage with Alicia is honestly, is when I failed her in some capacity. Um, I'm kind of broken about it. I'm, I'm upset with myself. I know I don't deserve her forgiveness, but I go to her and I apologize anyway. And then there's been times that she's agreed with me that I don't deserve her forgiveness, but yet she points to the cross and she says, I don't deserve God's grace myself, yet I have it. And with that, I can extend grace to you. I think there's nothing more refining, nothing more overwhelming, nothing more healing than receiving grace. So in light of that, I have two tips in selecting a spouse, just two. So the first one is, is simple. It's choose someone who clearly loves Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that someone says they love Jesus, but they actually see the fruit in their lives. So there's kind of three things to look for. I have like a little A there. Um, do they have a consistent walk with Jesus? Is it kind of evident? Do they read, engage with scripture? Um, can they answer this question? The question would be like, what has God been teaching you? And can they answer that with a real question or a real answer without kind of making something up on the go? Um, that's important. B, are they sensitive to the spirits leading in their life? My wife, Alicia, always says that the Holy Spirit is the third person in our marriage because often he's the one that's kind of convicting me or her and bringing us together. And I think that's really important to see that in a spouse. Like um, a question you could ask that would kind of reflect this is like, what sin has God been convicting you of lately? That's a good first date question. And then C, uh, do they live out their faith? Do they walk the walk? Um, do they share their faith? Do they serve? Do they lead a Bible study? Are they... They serve within a local church. Um, and maybe a, a question you can ask with that is like, how have you been recently serving God? Um, this past week, I was talking to Carrie from Carrie's Corner, and uh, he was talking about after graduation, he wants to go and possibly um, help out with coaching maybe high school football. And then he really wants to do some kind of ministry associated with those athletes. And I I think that's like an example of like walking the walk and wanting to have a clear, clear mission. Men, little, another little tip is I think when, women find it attractive when you have a clear direction in your life. So you can just jot that one down. But <clears throat> so why do I say this? Why do I say that? Like, that's the number one criteria. It's like someone who clearly loves Jesus. And I think it's if they aren't receiving God's love and grace and submitting to Jesus, it's not likely they will extend grace to you or submit to you or sacrificially love you. And then my second, my second tip for selecting a spouse is before you even look at a spouse, develop point one in your own life, in your own life for yourself. You can't give what you don't have. So those are my two tips. The, I think the exciting part of this is that by uh, selecting a spouse who truly loves Jesus, um, you have a chance to rewrite the story of your life and for your kids. I mean, you may have had a childhood like that Netflix movie where fighting was the norm. And you think that marriage might be just a place where um, a thing that people hate each other from. Um, but what's amazing is Jesus, you know, and I guess I should say like, Jesus doesn't make fighting go away completely. You can ask my kids that. But what he does do is we, as we walk with Jesus, he continues to change us and mold us into the men and women he intended us to be. He softens our hearts towards our spouses, and he starts to write new stories in our lives, stories that reflect his love and his beauty. Let me pray for us. Dear Jesus, um, I thank you that you do reflect um, so much in, in your creation and that we could reflect, reflect you. Um, and I, I pray that um, gosh, all these students who, who will graduate and go on, that the ones who do get married, I pray that they would um, truly discern that their spouses would, would clearly follow you and love you. 
that they would experience not only this unconditional love and grace from you, God, but they would experience that from their spouses and their kids and their neighbor and their yeah, neighbors and their friends and their coworkers would see the reflection of your unconditional love and that that would be attractive to them. I pray, Lord, um, yeah, and thank you for, for your word and, and all the things that we can learn from it. So thank you for tonight. Thank you for Jeremy um, and his testimony. In the name I pray, Jesus. Amen.